Hello and welcome to the West Ham Transfer Rumour Show which has been headlined by none other than Danny Ings being linked to West Ham. In this episode we've got players you've definitely heard of, some players you've possibly never heard of, some unrealistic transfer rumours relating to West Ham. Of course there is, it wouldn't be a West Ham Transfer Rumour Show without the unrealistic rumours. We've got a couple of them, don't you worry. We've got some news regarding players returning to West Ham and also a small reminder regarding squad registration rules which may restrict what West Ham can actually do in the January transfer window. But first, we're going to kick it off with Danny Ings. Everton have had a loan move rejected by Aston Villa. They have no interest in loaning out Danny Ings in the January transfer window. However, they appear to be open to selling him. The fees believed to be between 10 and 15 million. West Ham are being linked to him, as are Everton still, Bournemouth and a return to Southampton. Now... Unai Emery has said that he's spoken to some Aston Villa players regarding leaving Villa Park in the January transfer window, but Danny Ings is not one of them, and he expects Danny Ings to be part of the squad for the remainder of the season. That definitely sounds like something somebody would say who's trying to increase the price of Danny Ings, or possibly just telling the truth and he's not actually for sale. But there's a lot of reports suggesting Danny Ings will be sold in January. It's everywhere. You can't miss it, really. It's just a case of where is he going to go rather than is he going to be sold. But that's what Unai Emery says. So in the interest of balance in this one, the manager's stating he's not for sale. I could understand, I could see either or happening actually, because I think he's got some some minutes under Emery, although it appears Watkins will be his first choice striker whilst he is in form. But he still had minutes, he's came off the bench, he scored against Wolves as well, so he's still definitely got a part to play, but, you know, 15 million for a 30 year old striker possibly might not be bad business for Aston Villa and would give Emery a bit of funds to start making that his squad in this transfer window, should he wish to. In regards to Ings coming to West Ham, I would love it. And it's not just because I'm a big fan of Danny Ings. For those that haven't been around for five years, which is a lot of you, when he was at Liverpool, I really wanted Danny Ings to come to West Ham. And a lot of people agreed, a lot of people disagreed. But anyway, it's been a long-running joke. And obviously, he did really well at Southampton. Um, I would still love him at West Ham. It, it's all circumstantial. A year ago, I wouldn't have because I wanted to see us sign somebody like Gianluca Scamacca. And Antonio was performing relatively well back then. So it was a case of they would be enough. Now, I don't think they are. Gonza's done a video later about the striker situation. So I'm not going to discuss it too much. But essentially, I think we need a striker in January transfer window. We need somebody that's going to come in and score goals. Danny Ings all but guarantees goals. Would he start every game? No, Skamaka probably would. But when you need a goal during a game, I've lost faith in Antonio coming off the bench to score that goal. Danny Ings coming off the bench, however, I would have faith in him scoring that goal. In terms of goal per 90 minutes in the Premier League so far this season, he's the seventh best. So he's still scoring. He's still providing goals for his team. Yes, the age thing is not ideal, but we're not in an ideal situation. We're down the bottom of the table. I think for 10, 15 million for a striker that you know almost guarantees you goals between now and the end of the season, I think you've got to do it. If, you're in, if West Ham were eighth in the table right now, saying, no, that's bad business, there's no, no longevity in this transfer, that in a year's time, in 18 months' time, we'd be looking to replace Danny Ings. But because of where we are, I think it's a no-brainer to buy somebody that you know will score between now and then the season. Goals earn points. Goals earn points. Danny Ings earns points. Um... So, yes, it's all circumstantial. Danny Ings to West Ham, yes, please. Do I believe it? Not really. Um, I struggle to really believe that this link is genuine. I think him leaving Aston Villa, I, I do believe that to some extent. Going, staying in the Premier League, yes. My worry is, actually, if he ends up at an Everton or a Bournemouth or Southampton, because the clubs that have been linked to him are all in that relegation battle. And my worry is that whoever gets him gets those goals and it increases their chances of surviving relegation. So I hope he comes to West Ham for West Ham. But also, there is an element of the Chris Wood to Newcastle thing. Remember when they bought Chris Wood from Burnley? And my theory was, A, he'd do a bit of a job for Newcastle. He will become the third choice striker, which he has. And B, kick Burnley into trouble, push them into that relegation zone. And there's an element of that. If West Ham were to sign Danny Ings, we'd be taking away a top target for the teams around us. Says, yeah, you're not having that goal scorer. We're having him. He's going to give us goals and we're going to stop you getting your first choice scorer. Danny Ings to West Ham. Yes, please. Michael Keane. Uh, <laughs> 
Right, I've got, a different, I've got a different answer to this one. He's been linked to West Ham as a loan move. Obviously, not getting any game time at Everton whatsoever. Frank Lampard isn't using him. He's got Tarkowski and Cody as his main centre-backs. Mina's ahead of him in the pecking order as well. Godfrey, Holgate. There's plenty of centre-backs ahead of Michael Keane at Everton. And I, <laughs> it's understandable. I... I really don't want to see Michael Keane at West Ham. We got offered Michael Keane before he went to Everton. Um, I say we as the club rather than an individual manager. We obviously rejected it. Uh, I, I don't want to see him here. I do think there might be a necessity to do business at centre-back for West Ham. Obviously, Gerd and Zuma look like our first-choice centre-back partnership. We've not seen that partnership yet. We haven't seen it. You know, we're into January now. It'll possibly be February before we see them play. Hopefully, they'll be available for the Everton and Wolves back-to-back -back games. But it's the middle of January. We've still not seen our first-choice partnership. So we cannot rely on that. We've got Dawson still wanting out. There's rumours that Dawson still wants to go in this window. Regardless, I don't think he played particularly well against Leeds United. Tito Kerr's all over the place at the minute. So... Ogbonna, can he still do it in Premier League? I'm not too sure. I thought he looked okay against Brentford, and that was at best. But what I've seen in the Conference League hasn't inspired me that he's still up to the level of the Premier League. Not his fault. You know, he's 34 years old. He'd come back from a big injury. He's still got a part to play. But I wouldn't be surprised to see West Ham enter the market for a centre-back this window. And a lone move for somebody with Premier League experience... It makes sense. And I actually worry that this rumour is true. Do I want to see it happen? No. Do I think it could happen? Yeah, I do, actually. A player not getting game time at his club to come to a team that he could get game time, we possibly need a centre-back. It, it makes sense. It does. There is a bit of logic to it, and I think that's what worries me the most. But, uh, no, I don't wish to see Michael Keane uh, come to West Ham. Now, from one centre-back to the next, this one is Harry Suter of Stoke City. Uh, I know quite a lot of Stoke fans these days, and uh, they all rave about him. They all think that he would easily cut it. You can see Collins now doing it uh, for Wolves as well. Come up from the Championship, come up from Stoke as well. And Suter is sort of expected to be better, or is currently better, than Collins. Had a fantastic World Cup with Australia as well. Really big player, 6'6", six six, I think he is. But he's really mobile for his size. Good with the ball at his feet. His distribution is brilliant. Some of his long passes are, you know, Van Dyke-esque, but it's... Obviously, within the championships, it's possibly a bit easier to play that quarterback role there. But those long balls out of defence are something that he's more than capable of doing as well. And they're, they're, they're accurate passes. They're not punts up to the striker. It's, you know, fizzing 50 yards balls onto the feet of your winger out on the touchline kind of passes, which we see Connor Cody and Van Dyke do in the Premier League. Would I like to see Suter at West Ham? Yes. But the price tag would be enormous. You'd be paying north of £20 million to get him. They're obviously possibly in a relegation battle themselves in the Championship. I can't see him going anywhere. He's just returned in time for the World Cup. He's just returned from a big injury as well. I'd be surprised if he was on the move in January. Being linked to other Premier League clubs, like the Wolves as well, I don't really see West Ham being front runners for his signature, despite the rumours. And like I said, I would like to see him actually. Right-sided player as well. Um, I think that would be clever business, but not one I can see happening. Unfortunately, now... Are we ready for some unrealistic rumours? Well, this one's a bit of a domino effect. So the first one is Declan Rice going to Arsenal. That's not unrealistic. I can see that happening. There's only so many clubs that can afford Declan Rice. There's only so many clubs that appeal to Declan Rice. Chelsea look like they're going to go sign Enzo Fernandez. Do they still have the money? Do they still have the desire to get Declan Rice as well? It's possible to have Rice and Fernandez in midfield. would we'll sort their midfield out for years to come. But Arsenal have been linked to him recently. And it's one of those moves that sometimes I think just makes sense. The price tag, we know Arsenal's not willing to spend the money. They're going to go close to winning the title this season. If they don't win it, they won't be too far away. There's a lot of promises about that project going on at the Emirates. So for somebody like Declan Rice to be appealed by it, it makes sense. I wouldn't blame him if he thought Arsenal's a club I want to go to. It means he remains in London as well. He's spoken a lot about family, how important it is. That's why sometimes when he gets linked to one of the Manchester clubs, there's a little bit of doubt over whether the move would come round or not. 
Arsenal ticks a lot of the boxes. Unfortunately, I uh, would prefer he didn't go there, but it makes sense. Now, the domino effect is who's going to replace Declan Rice, and we're being linked to Ajax defensive midfielder and Mexican defensive midfielder Edson Alvarez. Now, he was linked to Chelsea in the summer, and they had a £43 million bid rejected for the 25-year-old. I've seen quite a bit of it. I say quite a bit. I haven't really. I don't mind watching Ajax. I like watching Ajax. seen a bit of them in the Champions League as well because of the group stage um, with the teams that they were involved in. I ended up watching a lot of Ajax. Wouldn't be my preferred Ajax player. We can all guess who that is. But I'll tell you what, if it was realistic, if, he, if we had a chance of getting him to replace Declan Rice, I'd be all over it. I think it would be a fantastic signing. Obviously, they've rejected 43 million. So what is his price tag? 50, 60 million. It would give you a bit of leftover lolly, you'd imagine, when you sold Declan, that you'd have a little bit of extra money to get in a top quality player alongside Alvarez. It's just a case of, is it realistic? I'm not too sure. I imagine there's Champions League clubs that he could go to and play for. Um, well, he's at Ajax, isn't he? But would he come to West Ham? I think it would depend how the rest of the season unfolds. If we scrape by and stay in the Premier League, and probably not have do if we were to climb to comfortable safety and make a go of it in the Conference League, possibly we would come a bit more attractive. Could we afford him? Yeah, we could. We can afford the chance, assuming we stay in the Premier League, we can afford the transfer fee, we can afford his wages, so that's not a problem. It's just the stature of the club, the appeal of the club. Could we get him in? And I think of all the names I see being linked to us to replace Declan Rice, he's actually somebody that, I, one of the few that I actually think, you know what, I would love that to happen. I, I would like that. I think he's a top player. Really busy defensive midfielder. Interceptions is brilliant. His tackling is brilliant. His passing is really good. There's not many weaknesses to his game for the job that he does on the pitch. Now, he is a bit more defensive midfielder y than deck but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Especially, if we're going to keep deploying Paqueta where we've seen him in the last couple of games. I think maybe going down the route of a more traditional defensive midfielder. I know we've got Flynn Downs, but for whatever reason, he's not trusted there. But going down that, that route to somebody who's a bit more of a protection shield for the back four, I think Alvarez is up there, actually. It's a deal that I would love to see. It won't be happening in January anyway. Like I said, the rumour is that he's going to replace Declan in the summer. It's, it's difficult to rule out because there's still half the season to go, really. But, uh, yeah, so far, so good for me. I would love to see that happen. Next up, we've got somebody I've never heard of, uh, Kofi Kau. Never, don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's the 24-year-old right back at Mets, who are obviously in the second division in French football. So why would have I ever seen him play? However, the fact that we've been linked to right backs is relatively promising, isn't it? But we know West, we know West Ham have kept an eye on the French transfer market for a, f a few seasons now, and it's somewhere that we scout heavily and we try and keep our ear to the ground on for upcoming talent yet to see much of it come to come to light but we're certainly always linked to players like that French league so I'm not going to dismiss this one but I'm not going to give it any credibility either I have no clue however you're sat at home thinking A you're butchering his pronunciation and B I know about him please let me know in the comments uh, also all the players that were being linked to uh, I mentioned in this video you can get their player profile on transfer market in the description below so you can click it and have a little read while I'm talking about them next up we've got Ruslan Malinkovsky. Uh, I'm struggling to read my own writing more than anything. Atalanta, Ukrainian attacking midfielder, centre midfielder. No, just let's just dismiss this one and move on, shall we? He's 29. For an attacking midfielder, he, he's not very prolific. And what's he got? I, I did. I can't read this one. Don't worry. One goal and two assists so far this season. Although most of his appearances are off the bench. I've seen a bit of him. I've seen more of him in a Ukraine shirt this season than I have in an Atalanta shirt and he didn't really stand out when we we Scotland when we played Ukraine he didn't really Mudrick stole all the headlines he's off to Arsenal or Chelsea possibly likely Arsenal he stole all the headlines he was head and shoulders their best player on the pitch we've been linked to him anyway but I'm scoring a line through it just don't believe it in the slightest an attacking midfielder we don't even have, we're not even playing with an attacking midfielder at the minute. Um, I just completely unrealistic. Let's move on to an even more unrealistic one, though. Marcus Turam, somebody I think everybody's heard of, really. Um, striker for Gladbach, formerly a left winger. I mean, having a really good season, 10 goals and 3 assists. His contract expires in the summer, though. This is why he's available and this is why he's cheap. €12 million, Euro, just over £10 million pound he's available for in the January transfer window because they're looking to get some money for him rather than him leaving for free. French international, 
I don't believe this in the slightest, by the way. He is being linked to West Ham. I just don't believe we've got any chance of getting him. The, the reports are that the other reports, the ones that don't link him to West Ham, the ones about Marcus Tuvam solely, are linking him to the likes of PSG, Man United. Man United seemed before run. And do you know something? I think he would actually suit Ten Hag and what they're doing at Old Trafford. But the rumours are he's actually quite happy to sit there for the next six months, go for free and have the pick of his clubs. And he wants a Champions League club. So, um, yes, kind of exciting for about three seconds to see West Ham linked to Marcus Turam. Then reality hits. You rule it out. And you go back to my... <laughs> Like um, this, well, we'll do the squad registration rules and then a, a bit more news. Yeah, let's do the squad registration rules. So obviously, West January transfer window. West Ham currently have 24 players registered. You can register 25 players with the Premier League. We've got 24 registered. Under 21s don't need to be. So our new signing, Luis Eyal, doesn't need to be registered. So if we sign anybody this window, they have to be registered. So we've, essentially, we've got space for one player. One player is what we've got space for. Obviously, if the players leave, we can bring players in. But if I was to say to you right now, who's the most likely player to leave? You might say Connor Commentary, Dan Randolph. That would make sense. The other thing you have to take into consideration is you have to have eight homegrown players in that 25. West Ham currently have eight. That includes Connor Coventry and Dan Randolph. So if Connor Coventry was to leave in January, it frees up a space, but only for a homegrown player, assuming we fulfil the other one. I'll probably butcher that. Let me explain. So we've got 24 players in a minute. Let's say we sign a foreign player. Let's say we sign Coffee Cowell, that right back. Let's say we sign him. He gets registered. We've now got our full squad of 25. Connor Coventry then leaves. We've freed up a space. However, that space has to be fulfilled by somebody that's homegrown. So that is a Danny Ings. That is a Michael Keane. Um, somebody that was brought that had three years, minimum three years, at an academy in England. So they don't, they don't have to be English, just an academy in England for those three years. Um, so it's it's a little bit... West Ham are perhaps a little bit restricted by what they can do in the January transfer window, but certainly there's one vacant spot where they can sign anybody and put, put them straight into the squad. And then it's a case of one out, one in, probably from here on in. But West Ham have recalled three players. We've recalled Thierry Neves. We've also recalled Dan Chester's from their loans. They weren't getting any game time. Both clubs were involved in a relegation battle. But perhaps more disappointingly, we've had to recall Armstrong Uncleflex from Swansea. Now, the problem with this is because Uncleflex is featured for West Ham this season, you're only allowed to play for two clubs per season, so he can't go anywhere. He's stuck at West Ham. The only place he can go is Swansea, unless he goes to a team that plays in a country whose season starts in January, which is incredibly unlikely because it would mean he's probably got to go to the likes of South America or something. That's why... Nottingham Forest are going to struggle with Emmanuel Dennis. He's apparently been told he can leave, but he's played for Watford and Nottingham Forest this season, so he, he can't go anywhere in England. He's got to go somewhere where the season starts in January to get around the FIFA ruling. So Armstrong Alcoflex looks like he's set for the second half of the season at West Ham. He is only 20 years old, so he doesn't have to be registered. So he can still feature in the Premier League. So I'd imagine we'll see him having a big part in the under-21s for the remainder of the season. And lastly, Arthur Masuaku is likely to return. And this is the problem. If he does return, we've got to re we don't have to. But if we do register him, that's the squad full. So I'd imagine there's going to be a bit of a, a panic, if you like, that if Masuaku does come back from Besiktas, that we need to let him leave, essentially, for possibly for free, just get him out. Um, but he's in the same situation. Um, it's a difficult one. Masuaku returning to West Ham could be a bit of a problem uh, for West Ham in terms of squad registration rules. So we'll have to wait and see. But that's it for the first episode of the January Transfer Window West Ham Transfer Rumour Show. I've enjoyed it, actually. It's, it's nice to do these videos and not speak about the manager for a little bit. I know that's on me. I don't have to speak about the manager. But that's the news. That's the topics. That's my opinions. So, uh, Transfer Rumour Show. Danny Ings, let's hope so. Michael Keane. Let's hope not. That's my opinion anyway. But if you've enjoyed this Transfer Rumour Show, please do drop a like on it by clicking a thumbs up. It helps the channel out. Subscribe if you to Hamish Chat. And I'll catch you tomorrow. Uh, we play Brentford, so we're live at 4.25. 25 past 4 tomorrow. I'll see you then.